Welcome everybody. This is the PEG Access Advisory Committee, October 26th. Thank you very much all for coming. Um, I want to note that this meeting is being recorded. And what I'd like to do briefly is to make sure that we've got everybody here. Um, it looks like we have a quorum. I'm Carlin Reed, I'm the chair. Um, and I'd like to have Cynthia introduce herself, then Vince, and then Christine and, and Terry as well. Uh, Cynthia Rainey, Concord School Committee, Concord Kyle Regional School. Hold the microphone a little bit closer to you. No, the microphones are not connected. So not connected. It's this. It's this one. Okay. Oh, yeah. Never mind. <laughs> an outdoor voice. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm relatively new to the PAAC, um, and I'm sort of just learning, but it's an exciting time to have joined uh, with this work. So thank you, Vince. Uh, I'm Mark of the uh, Big Access Committee. I was uh, started out on this as a member of CCTV way back when. I kind of moved up through the uh, ranks here to the board of CCTV and then to the paid access board. Very glad for that too. Terry? Just I'm the select board liaison. And uh, so far it's been a good experience. Carlin has everything so well organized. Uh, thanks for us. Great, thank you. Christina? I'm uh, Christina Kendrick and I'm with the Council on Aging. I'm on the board of Council on Aging. And I'm the liaison. This is my first, first meeting. Good. I'm so glad you're able to make it to us. Sue? Uh, I'm Sue Buskey. Uh, I am um, with the Buskey Group, and we are the firm that's been contracted by the town to assist in the franchise slash license renewal process. So I'm going to be talking a lot about what that process is today and what your involvement will be. Um, just as a little quick background, I've been working in this field for 45 years. Um, and um, I do everything from franchise negotiations to setting up community access TV stations um, and doing strategic planning and kind of everything you can guess, think about with regard to the relationship between a city or town and the cable operator and in anything related to community programming. Okay. Thank you very much, Sue. Mark, you're next. And I'm Mark from Minuteman Media. <laughs> And uh, I'm the production manager for uh, for the town of Carlisle and Concord's uh, Minuteman Media. Hi, Nancy. Okay, Nancy, if you feel like saying hello, go ahead and say hello and what you're oh, doing here. Oh, yes. Uh, I'm Nancy Pierce. I'm a, I live in Carlisle. I report for the Carlisle Mosquito and off and on over the last five or six years, I've written articles and editorials about Comcast, about cable broadband about the licensing just off and on I, it's not like a regular thing that we write about but i'm just i just watch in case there's something having to do with carlisle that's important so thank you sounds good nancy thank you so much okay uh, to the agenda a couple of chair updates then we'll start getting towards our program um three things i have town paperwork pack awards annual town report this is all we're going to be for the next meeting uh, in December sometime, we're going to be talking about the date in a moment here. Town paperwork, make sure everybody has done their ethics training and is compliant with uh, whatever Lori Austin and the rest of the clerk's office has to say. So, because uh, they, she sent me a notice saying, you need to do this, you need to do this, fine. I just want to make sure the rest of the committee members um, also do that sort of thing. Christina, you are exempt from that because you're not a committee member. You lucked out. <laughs> but for council, yeah. thing. right? <laughs> that's sort of thing for council. Okay. Um, second thing is pack awards. Uh, this is something we'll do. We usually present at the end of the term, which will be in June. So if you have some ideas of whom to give pack awards to, or how to do it, or what to do, let me know. We'll talk about it again some more at the next meeting. And the last item is the annual town report. This is something that our committee does every year. I'll do a draft of it and I'll circulate it around uh, to the folks. That, and if you have any, any edits, send it back to me. We don't want to violate open meeting law, but I do want to get your input on what this is. Basically, a summary of what we've done the last 12 months. That's kind of what the town report. And I have to write it as if it ends as of the end of December. And then, well, I'm going to give you the draft on. Um, no, December deadline. one or two. Okay. The town deadline hasn't been set. Last year it was January something. Okay. But I'm going to try and get it in by December sure. 31. Yeah. So we'll see how things work out. Um, I don't even know who's going to be in charge of doing the town report, but I suspect it might be somebody. 
It could be Chris, it could be Shannon, it could be, it could be the town It'll be a combination of folks, I suspect. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Anyway, so those things you'll see information about that at the next meeting. Um, let's do a quick update on uh, from uh, Mark on MMN, and then after that we'll turn over to Sue Buskey. If you want to go ahead, Mark. Sure. Uh, Jason is um, in full swing as as the town manager for the station. He's got uh, three full time employees that work for him, myself, Tori, and Matt. And then we've got uh, four part time employees that um, that have varying degrees of skills that um, assist in um, after hours or larger events for Concord and Carlisle. So, uh, so he's got seven employees that kind of work for him now. Um, and I kind of was looking at, you know, every every week I read a you know, little report, but I think um, what was interesting to just state for today's meeting is um, we have 52 different meetings that are uh, all Concord meetings that we get um, Zoom meetings for, um, not including the Council on Aging and other things too. So there's even more uh, there. So we process um, 52 different meetings. Um, some of those go live to cable. So whether it's um, you know select board or the school committee. Um, so, so far this year, we've had 437 um, meetings recorded and sent to either our YouTube channel or um, available online with, um, or not available online, but on our cable uh, system. Um, also in the public realm, not just the government realm, but the public realm, um, we've had, we finished 46 um, requests for events. And uh, a Zoom meeting is something that as we're doing today, the button is recorded there and you just sit and wait for the file. And okay, I play around with a little computer here and I move some things around, yes. But for these public events, they require us to bring uh, switchers, mixing boards, cameras, um, connections to screens, uh, lights. Uh, you know, there's, there's a wider variety of things that we do for the public, depending on um, the, the need or complexity um, that they'd like to have. So sometimes it's a presentation for, for a person. Um, these days, it's been the, uh, the folks at, um, at the author's event. So um, my, my eyes are really saggy lately because these go on till 10 at night and have been going on and, and, and another and another and another. Um, and so, uh, so we've had a lot of public events and, and uh, we're, we just, we love to do the public stuff because it's more entertaining, more, more challenging. You know, there's this, uh, you know, sometimes more than one person at them. Sometimes it's just me. Um, but uh, we've got 17 left in the, that's in our queue right now. And they kind of come every, you know, every week there's another bunch and another week there's another bunch and, and all that stuff. So, so we've got 17 left that are on our calendar at the moment. Some have to do with uh, the high school, you know, the, the uh, music kind of things that are going on and, um, and all that good stuff. So I just think that was what I came up with as a quick overview of the amount of work that we get going on. Um, uh, anyway, so um, anything else I should talk about, please ask me. <laughs> well, uh, um, a couple questions. So in those events, are you including on um, like town meetings that one live live events or is that a different? Category. Well, I guess there's one a year, so they're not a very well, good. <laughs> they, they are the most important event. Purely get that it without that event, we're useless as a you know community group. We've got to do that event. Perfect. Oh, right, but, so um, we seem to be doing two a year now. Yeah. Um, and then also, I saw you at the Toronto Fair Center. Yeah. Which is what you know the twenty twenty five event. That was great to have you. So those kind of events. Yeah, that was in one of the the. Uh, 46. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, because those are really kind of fun to be yeah, at. And, yeah, and we take there. still pictures, we do video, we're either, you know, well, that one wasn't live, but uh, okay, my other question parades. is um, about the meetings. So, for a select board meeting, we learned the other day 
not only is there the MMN um, person, but there's the person taking minutes, and then there's a third person doing the Zoom. It just seems like amazing that we need to stack the. We want to have a lot of transparency, um, but is, is there any way you think they could combine the Zoom and the MMN? Or, I, get, I know this isn't even on the agenda today. So well, it's okay. That's that. I well, it's a good thing to talk about. So um, we, we, you know, I've written a policy that isn't a policy, but I've written something that says, what is our role? in these meetings. And I was um, confronted with people that are new to the town positions and they bring with them what they used to do at the other town to us. We have $15 an hour young and career kids that should not be responsible for the Zoom meeting, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. If you want them to elevate what they do, they may in fact miss some of the things that they're struggling to do today when it comes to some of the the uh, visibility of some of these things. So if they're letting people in, if they're looking at hands raised, if they're doing, turning on things, it gets very confusing and they may fall down on what their real task is, which is to make sure they get the audio correct and the video correct. And, and uh, when it's just a Zoom between houses, then they don't need us. But when it's in a room like this and there's mics to be talked about and there's all this stuff, it, it just, became clearer to me that if they want to add that extra step of also being the admin and the host and the other things to the meeting, that that may not be what we want these $15 an hour uh, young and career kids to. The person I think who's doing the selectable meeting, I don't think he's a young, um, an experienced person, but I could be wrong. Um, yeah, so he's, he's um, yeah. So um, he does this meeting in this room, in that room there, and he does it because he's, you know, he's got the, uh, you know, he has that down. You know, that's, this room is easy enough. Uh, but the rest of knowing who people, I mean, he can't look at that screen. He's not looking at the screen anymore. He's paying attention to cameras and mics and to look at another screen and let people in and know who's yeah. uh, taking notes and who's yep. who's uh, sharing screens and things. School committee does a wonderful job at it because <laughs> they she'll go home, she'll 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 dial in and we'll talk to her and say, hey, how's it going? It may seem like we're just chatting about life. She's verifying that the screens are working. She's verifying that the mics are working. She now takes ownership of the meeting and she lets people in. She shuts mics off. She pays attention to rogue people that are coming in. She shares her screen when asked to. I mean, there's a lot yeah. more. And I remember before we had a young man sitting in that chair that would do all of that live, right? When he was taking notes and he'd pay attention to who's in there and he'd let people yeah. in and he'd share a screen. And it was like, we can't take ownership of that also at the same time. It's just a lot of work. Yeah, but, I think the public probably doesn't realize, you know, they want transparency, but they don't realize how much staff is really involved in all of this. Yeah. And you said you also do the, like you do the authors big stay at the library. And that's yeah. Just, I didn't realize that. That's, and, that's a lot. And the League of Women Voters, we've got a huge DEI event going on. <laughs> this is the third one. This is yeah. my truck. You'll see my truck will be filled which is on my list of vehicles that we would need. Anyways, but my truck will be filled. Lights, presentations, computers, um, microphones, uh, cameras. We don't do what it used to be, just a single camera with a button you know, called yeah. cord. Right. We could, right. but Otherwise, we really, yeah. we really don't. The expectation, yeah. Zoom has killed us. Oh, of course. And I don't mean that negatively. I'm excited, but you're inside of a small box called your house. Zoom <laughs> takes care of all your audio for you. And you're within three feet of a screen, which is looking up your nose. And so you get a beautiful view of all your face. And, and we can't, you know, we can't do that with this. And, and we have to have, you know, microphones and blah, 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 blah. And so, but when it comes to these events that we get asked to go do, we're not the old yeah. school, just come with a camera and record it from a corner. We compete with a few people in town and they stand on a table and shoot down at the audience. And it just gets me 
just livid that that is acceptable in this day and age. That we do two cameras, we do eye level, we pay attention to audio, we manage this as a real paying production. And that is, uh, you know, I'm not, but that's what we're competing with in, you know, in the world today. And, and that's what I try to do when it's, you know, more about some of some things. Um, Which is why we have a PEG fund to support this kind of activity. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we've been able to use that fund recently to upgrade um, to equipment that is not ever been standard, but is now becoming standard mm -hmm. in, in what we need with, you know, digital converters and HDMI and, and we have uh, digital mixing boards for audio that automatically mutes microphones and just, I mean, there's a bunch of stuff. Mm -hmm. The technology that we're stepping into now is... Uh, you know, it's different and it takes a little bit of time to set it up but the quality that we get out of it if we want quality mm -hmm. um, is uh is i i'm very proud of what we've been able to do it's 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 very higher level than just our camera in a corner so okay other questions so, from mark sorry <laughs> well, I, so I think there was an opportunity to streamline the uh Workflow is kind of a multidisciplinary thing. You know, it involves town manager's office, you know, Chris Carmody and the guy that used to sit in that chair when you were around. Yeah. Jeremy? Yes, Jeremy. And, um, but everything from when Mark is manning the cameras or his staff is manning the cameras back there. And there's what, three or four venues like that, right? I mean, there's this room. There's the main meeting room. Um, Kai's Road. Kai, well, no, Kai's Road is by itself. Okay. Uh, or this fan company usually? Yeah. Here. Here, there. Oh, okay. So yeah. there's really only two men. They know where you're manning yeah. cameras, right? Ripley. Right. right. Ripley in here. Yeah. 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 Well, what about Harvey Wheeler? They want to be there. Yeah. So the rest of them, though, I think can be substantially more unmanned mm -hmm. at this stage. And Mark, you and I were talking about this a little bit last week. One of the big issues that's I know involving uh, the time of our staff is collecting all of the um, Zoom video information once the meeting is over. And it seems like that responsibility is still kind of spread out amongst uh, the committee chair or somebody on the committee to tell them, hey, uh, you know, do they actually Mark, they actually who, who actually gives you the videos? The, um, when it's recorded like it is here, and 99% of people record it to the cloud, uh, after the meeting, the owner of the account gets an email saying your video has been processed. Okay. The owner of the account, whoever that is, right. and and then they then forward it to an a, an unattended mailbox that we've established, so that any one of our team can see it. And so when they send it there, that's how I did the counts of, mm -hmm. uh, of what's there because uh, because that goes into there. And then, you know, there's normally one person who does it, but when she's on vacation or out or whatever, we, we've, we've moved it into a process that's somewhat automated that, that it, you know, we build a couple of things and then we, you know, sh you know, ship it off to another machine, machine runs for two hours, you know, processing it, and then we drop it into all the different places. So. Uh, so we've automated as far as we can, I think. Um, but well, you were telling me one of the things, there's several different accounts. Uh, there's more, I mean, I have no idea how many accounts there are. I'm, uh, I'm not privy to understanding that, so. And some of it is non-standard. Like, I, I know the video for our last meeting in September was done at a very low resolution. It was done at a 640 by 360 resolution. The issue with that is, is if you've got some detailed information on yeah. the screen, yeah, yeah. the PowerPoints are okay, but if somebody tries to show up a spreadsheet, it's yeah. unreadable. Yeah. You, know, you need something sharper than that. Right. So there, there is a combination of tech -like issues and things that I think. Well, the other thing I that comes into play there, there also is if you're watching it on the channel, you're watching it on SD. And you really can't see it that okay if you're watching it online and it's recorded in hd then you're seeing it in hd which is one of the things that we'll get into when we talk about the, the license yeah. renewal process yeah. so that's another piece of that exactly what you're talking about so actually since there's so many different 
entities involved, I think really the next step is to have a kind of a working group. I think Chris Carmody was putting together a standards practice. So when I sent him my list of things to do before the meeting starts and during the meeting, he kind of said, yeah, that's nice. Don't send it out. I'll put it inside this bigger plan because, you know, people talk about their dogs and their pets and their <laughs> oils and all kinds of stuff. And then they start a meeting without really saying what meeting it is, yeah, what yeah. the day, yeah. you know, all that stuff. So anyway, so there was a document I, you know, kindly put together and then was told Chris is working on it, you know, back off. And I said, cool. Okay. okay. So there is, you know, hope I'm not throwing Chris under the bus, but <laughs> you'll find out. But I'll find out. Okay. <laughs> okay, so that's a starting point. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Before I turn this over to Sue, I want to take just a few minutes to do a schedule thing for our next meeting. Mm -hmm. So committee members, take a look at your calendar. Um, for some reason, I'm looking at December, the first Thursday or the first Friday of the month of December. December one is a Thursday, December two is a Friday. And I'm wondering if you three have any particular preference about this. And Terry, if you have any preference, let me know as well. Thursday is um, uh, December 1, and then Friday is December 2. Also timing. And Cynthia, I'm going to be looking at you first, because you're the one who has probably the most. Actually, anything in there? Yeah, for some reason, I have 3 o'clock in Kai's Road on Friday written down. I have no idea if that's what we talked about last time or what. But I don't know if you have a preference on Thursday or Friday. Do other people prefer? I'm open, so I'm open. They're both they're both good to me. I prefer Thursday if you want me to come, just because I'm off on Thursday. <laughs> good. That's a good Thursday. Okay, Thursday. Thursday at three thirty. Three thirty. Is that good for you, Tom? Yeah. Christina, how does that sound to you? Uh, Terry, Vince, three thirty. Okay, so the next meeting is going to be Thursday, December one at three thirty. And Sue, you will not be in town, but you'll be able to join by Zoom if you want to. I don't know if you want to. I actually Chris. want to. I have to check on that, but don't worry about me. I'll look at the recording okay. if I can't be there, but Absolutely. I do, do want good. to. Okay. That sounds good. Okay. All right. So that'll be the next meeting will be Thursday, December 1 at 3 o'clock, 3.30. And it will probably be here in the select board room. I will reserve the room and check on that. If there's a difference, I'll let you know. It'll be hybrid like we are right now. Good. 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 Okay. Sue, take it away. It's all up to you. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, let me know when you want to start it. You want to start it? Yeah. Okay. I want to start it. <laughs> that is a really, really can I? Nice yes. Just, uh, now I can click. Done. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, I thought that was a pretty picture. Yeah. <laughs> um, hey, but before we get to the more boring stuff, never mind. Um, it won't be boring, actually. Oops. All right. You, this isn't a clicker, is it? Oh, um, well. All right, you're going to have to push the okay. button unless I have my arm gets long. Actually, if I can, have, my arm's long. It's not quite that long. Always. <laughs> oh, the cable long enough. Oh, oh, okay. I have a clicker, actually. Okay. So now you can. Use, Where are you at? Oh, yeah, there. Okay. So, what I want to do today to start out with is. Um, uh, is, to, is to get a little bit of information from you guys about what you know about the license franchise renewal process, questions you bring to the meeting, um, things you want to learn at the end of this meeting. Because my job is to give you today is to give you a sense of what the license renewal process is about. I'll talk about some of the legal stuff, the technical stuff. I'm going to talk about the opportunities. I'm going to talk about the threats. And we're going to talk about the process. Okay. But I want to start in a place where you already know things. So if you have a question you bring to the meeting, um, fire away. And the whole purpose of what I'm trying to do today is also to be interactive. I do not want to stand up here and lecture, okay, or sit up here and lecture. I want to really provide you information and interact with you as questions start to surface. Okay. And so questions you have right now or things that you want to know, you want to learn as part of this meeting today. I'll start off with one. Okay. What's going on in Carlisle? Okay. <laughs> and I know you can't tell me what's going on in that negotiations because that's confidential, but we share a lot of services. They, they're our biggest client. What's going on in Carlisle? Okay. Other things. I'm making a list. Ah, okay. And I'm going to pull them in as we go along. Other things. I think I'm going to have more questions as you get into yeah, yeah. the presentation. Okay. Um, I've been through this before in, in, in other towns, but 
It's different in every town. So. And I suspect that this process that we're doing here will be different than in the other town yeah. that you did because our approach to franchise license renewal is somewhat different than some places that have, uh, it, it, they just take a, a different approach. So, okay. Um, so let her rip. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. So what, number one, the current license agreement expires in April of 2024. Okay. It was a 10 year agreement. Now think of it, 10 year agreement, go back 2024. Okay. 2014. Okay. Pro, the, the renewal process under law is a three year process. So, okay. 2013, go back 2011. So between sometime between 2011 and 2014, there was something happening here that caused the franchise to ultimately be renewed. Think about how much technology has changed in that time frame. Okay. So when we look at license or franchise renewal process, we're not looking at where we are today. We need to be looking at where we are in this case in 2034 in Concord. Mm -hmm. So it is really should be part of an ongoing communications planning process. All right. Um, and because of that, there are several key aspects to this process that are on the front end, which are called the community needs assessment process and the compliance review that we're gonna talk a lot about today. They are absolutely essential to creating the, the legal foundation for what the town will be able to go to the negotiating table with Comcast and try to negotiate for, okay? So that's why understanding and doing the front end of what the front end of this process is and why it's important is absolutely critical to what comes out the other end, okay? So that's, we're gonna talk a bit about that. Um, and and I think we'll just go on to the next one here. I'm, I'm going to let you click, and I'll just say next slide. Um, okay, so we're going to do cable basics. We're going to do what, uh, the who, what, when, and where of the state, federal and state franchise renewal process. Now, you'll notice I'm using the word franchise and license, and, and I'm using them interchangeably. Broadly speaking, the, the cable agreements between local governments and, and cable operators are called franchise. In Massachusetts, they're called licenses. So if you hear me use those words, they're the same thing. Okay, they're, they're exactly the same thing. Um, and you're gonna hear that a lot throughout the process because Massachusetts and, and a couple other states, the other places actually called them license. They're, they're franchise, that's what they are. Um, we're gonna talk about opportunities presented by the process that local governments have to go through, i.e. figuring out where are we gonna be in 2034, what are our needs going to be in this community for communications technologies? And I'm not, even though under law, the franchise renewal process technically only applies to the cable part of what a cable op, what Comcast does. Okay. Um, because we can't touch on the internet part because that's not part of section title six of federal law that lays out why you have franchises in the first place. You're going to, you should say to me, well, why in the heck? It's all in the same wire. It's because the law was written as ancient and it's never been updated, but we can still make it work for us. Okay, so so that's kind of uh, what you're going to learn more about as we kind of go through this today. And again, interrupt me if I'm not making sense. So because at the bottom there, I'm saying answer your questions. I mean, I'm going to feel really bad if you don't ask questions. Okay, because that means go for it. So I have no idea how to anticipate the technology and the needs 12 years from now. Mm -hmm. What are some ways that you go about doing that? Okay. Well, it's pretty hard to anticipate the technology, but figuring out what the needs are, uh, are a part of what the needs assessment process is. And, uh, and that process, and we're going to talk more about it further on today, is involves community public meetings, what we call focus group meetings. They're not bitch sessions by the way, <laughs> they're not, Comcast charges me too much. I mean, we want to hear about that, but more we want to hear about the school committee has got these plans going out the next five years for how we can more effectively use technology to provide information and educational materials to our community. It's about the forward-looking part of what a, com a community group, the school committee, the town, a nonprofit that provide a area a aging organizations. What so by knowing what the needs are of the organizations and entities that serve the community, 
we can better determine. We can't say what technology will be used for, mm -hmm. but we, we, we can pretty we can write language in the license agreement that says it has to be capable of doing these things. Okay, so we do that with the focus group meetings, and in this pro in this project we have two focus community focus group meetings scheduled, and then an, also an online survey. And I'll be talking more about the kind. In fact, Carlin and I went, went and the, she get, did a windshield tour for me this afternoon before the meeting because I really wanted to get a better understanding of Concord. Um, so, so we'll, we talked a little bit about, she was asking questions about the survey and we'll be asking all kinds of different questions and I'll tell you a whole lot more about how the online survey will work, but those are several of the ways that we'll be finding out. So it's not, we're not going to try to look into the crystal ball and be smarter about technology than other people. We're going to figure out what the needs are of the community and make sure what's in the license agreement meets those needs. And then and, and then the compliance part is an important part of what's in the license, new license agreement, but we'll get to that in a minute. So the franchise itself is a land use agreement. The cable company is putting its wires on public property. The town has responsibility for overseeing that property and giving entities access to that property. So essentially the cable company is a tenant on your property and the town has a responsibility for maintaining the having a relationship with that tenant, i.e. Comcast. So a cable operator being a tenant on the public's property has to pay rent for the use of the public's property. And that rent comes in the form of the franchise fees, which in your current license agreement is 5% of gross revenues. And that is actually the federal ceiling, okay? For, for franchise fees. The other, there's other kinds of rent for the use of the right of way. They are funding for equipment, for community media, what we now call community media, not access TV, okay? Um, it is connectivity, if we need connectivity to get a signal from point A to point B. It's either fiber or it could be equipment uh, that is used for all those purposes. It's making sure that the, um, the connectivity is, is available in ho all homes around the community. All of those things are part of the rent for the use of the right of way that we look at when we look at negotiating a, the current license agreement, as it was said a number of years ago, and a future one. Um, is, is, that, is it making, am I making sense? Is it mm -hmm. the pieces coming together? Okay. So the franchise obviously is this, says there will be available, determine the type, level, and um, functionality of the. I thought though that we didn't have 5% now. You have a 5% franchise fee, but 4.8%, okay, um, is what you actually get because uh, the way the gross, the definition of gross revenues is, okay, I'm going to get technical here, bear with me. The franchise fee is based on the gross cable TV revenues, not the internet and not the telephone. So we have, think of a basket. Okay, and cable company gets money from different things they do. They get money for people who do internet. They get money from uh, cable subscriptions. They get money from advertisers who want to put programming on. They get they get money from indirectly if you buy something on a home shopping channel. They get a portion of that coming back to the net. So, the gross revenue backs basket only contains the things that relate directly to the cable part. So, no internet, no telephone. Your gross revenue definition, and you have a five, your gross revenue definition determines, therefore, what that five percent consists of. Okay, now that right now your gross revenue definition specifically excludes several things that go to one thing goes to the, the the feds, okay, and one thing goes to the state, okay. So the franchise fee is five percent. But the definition of gross revenues means that certain things are taken out of that 5% and suddenly it becomes 4.8%. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But and, and, and we're getting into the weeds, but as members of this committee, it's good that you ask these questions. And, and I'm, I know that you'll probably ask them again, but, but the, that's, that's the answer to the question. A little bit technical, and if I get if I get too technical, stop me, and I'll, I'll I won't but do it. But you really need to understand this point. It's really important. Very good question. Um, local governments have to abide by a particular set of procedures when they go when the cable company says, "Hey, I want my franchise renewed." The cable company has to give the city or the town three, two and a half to three years notice. 
when they want and and the town has gotten that notice within the proper time window at that point in time then the town has or the city if it's a city or a town depending on the state we're in because it all varies a little bit by state okay uh, they have then a window of time from when that notification happens let's say it's three years 36 months out to when the current franchise agreement expires that's the time frame you have to do the renewal process and the renewal process includes that needs assessment, you know, those focus groups, the online survey, it includes determining if the company's complied with the current contract. All of that information comes together and it creates the foundation for the negotiations and then negotiations happen. I'll get into that more in the, but that's what we're talking about when we say the town has to abide by federal and state law. Uh, franchises are typically 10 years, although um, I am noticing um, in some places in Massachusetts, Verizon is trying to get shorter license agreements and you don't have Verizon, so you don't need to worry about it, but that's sort of the situation. Um, public input is critical to the process, and I think we can go to the next uh, next slide. So here's stuff you probably know. It's a 10-year license agreement. It expires in, in April of 2024. I will tell you, based on what's been happening in other places around Massachusetts and around the country, you may not get the process completed by April 2024. Okay. Why is that? There's a lot of reasons, but that I'm just telling you that that's what I observe happening. Um, and, and, that, and it can be the, the state uh, uh, cable and telecom division can approve a request for an extension of that window of time, of a window of time to complete if everybody is talking to each other and the process is moving forward. But that's why I said it's it could it likely that we'll need to be extended extended beyond that. We don't want to do that. It is not ideal, but that's what I see lately. Okay. Let me ask a question there. If there is a reason to extend the franchise, that's when our town council has to get involved with you. Is that right? Um, well, the way it has worked, and I'll give you an example in Carlisle. Yeah, the uh, and basically the. Um, Town manager directs the uh, town attorney to issue the request, right. and Comcast has re consistently okay. approved. So that's, the a, that's a crossover. All right. Mm -hmm. um, so that actually that gives you a sense that we are in extension. In answering your question about Carlisle, we are in an extension process in Carlisle right now. I was retained to help uh, somewhat in the front end of the process. We did a, a small, not uh, not as complete a needs assessment as we'll be doing here. We did a needs assessment there. We wrote an extensive needs assessment report. That report then identified a whole series of things that were to be negotiated before. I worked with town, a town city attorney to figure out what should be in, the, in draft, an updated version of the franchise agreement, and we're in that process with Comcast now. So that's kind of where it's at. Um, there are about 4,400 subscribers here in um, in Concord. There are about 6,700 homes pass. That makes for about a 65% what we call penetration level, which means the percentage of people who subscribe versus those who get, get at it, get it, is 65%. That's high. It didn't used to be high, but because of cord cutting that's gone on around the country, we've seen the penetration levels dropping. Okay. Um, I, the one in Malden is another place where I've been working. It dropped quite substantially from what it was 10 years ago when we did the process there 10 years ago. Um, and we'll go to the next slide. Um, so I want you to show you how valuable this agreement is to Comcast. Uh, and and, and he, this, this, these numbers start to shock people. Comcast will be able to generate at minimum by getting your license renewed, 63 over $63 million. And that assumes the rates for cable never go above $120 a month. Okay. That does not include internet and it does not include telephone service. So multiply that number by three and you're up to almost $200 million. That is the value of getting this license renewed to Comcast from a business perspective. This isn't small change. It's probably the big, most valuable contract the town would be dealing with. Nobody recognizes that fact, okay? Because I just go, oh, it's just cable TV, okay? But in, in, in so as, as we look at, going back to that, one of those first slides, we have, a cable company is a renter on your property. 
They need to pay rent for the use of that property. Nobody has a problem with them making money. But that's the level of money we're talking about. That's the value of getting that license renewed to Comcast as far as revenue that they'll generate just from the franchise agreement in Concord. People do not understand that that's really what's at stake here. So when we go, oh, maybe we can't ask for enough channels in H high definition. Well, if you think you're not, not that valuable, then maybe you can't ask for it. But the bottom line is you need to understand the value to the company of getting the town to sign off on approving the franchise agreement or the license agreement. Um, okay, so let's go to the next slide. Now, what's, let's take the snapshot right now. What's in your current license agreement? We have three channels for community programming for pay. There are, um, they're in SD, they're not in HD, okay? Um, you have a 5% annual cable, 5% uh, gross revenues. And that's, remember I said, I explained that 4.8%. You have it in writing in that slideshow now. So you, you don't have to remember it, okay? It's, that's part of the reason why I wanted you to have a piece of paper with stuff on it, because I am throwing a lot of stuff at you, okay? Um, the PEG capital grant that was in, that's in the current license agreement, as you can see, is $353,000 over 10 years, okay? And again, it's, it's right, you've got that on your slides there. Um, there is, under the license agreement, a fiber link required from the high school, which is the head end for community programming, the head end, to connect to Comcast so that then it can go out to the subscribers and people can see it in their homes. So there are other things in the license agreement and we can go to the next slide, but these are some of the key things that are community related. Yeah. Yes. Just a question is to the high school. Uh huh. And so it can, programming can go, can go out. Yes. To Comcast head end. Does Comcast provide any service, internet service for the high school, or is that something that the high school has to come Okay. To? This is not internet. I'm talking about the fiber connectivity to get the signal, however Comcast chooses to do it, but under the license agreements, there's going to be a fire connection between the high school where the, what we call math, I'll call it, I call it master control. That's air traffic control for all community programming is the high school, okay? If you think of that as air traffic control, they, they receive, they send, but when they're sending, they're sending it out to Comcast and they're sending out on the link that's obligated in, in, by the franchise agreement. In and to be fair, it's not the high school, it's the rooms that have been leased for, for Miniman Media. It doesn't go into the high school. It goes, passes through it, mm -hmm. but it comes straight to the, our back room. Mm -hmm. doesn't doesn't touch the high school in theory. How about the other vital services, you know, like the fire department and the police department? There's not the there are locations in the current license agreement that there the cable company is obligated to provide complementary cable service. Yes. Okay. okay. I don't have all of them memorized, but they're in the current license agreement. Now, I will tell you that's that's an area that's gotten quite tricky because of a recent FCC ruling that went to Sixth Circuit Court that went back to the FCC, but I won't get into it until later because it's. It's something that some the cable company will claim they don't have to do anymore, and they're prohibited from doing by law. But that, in fact, is not correct. Okay. Um, okay. All of the things that are in your current license agreement, the funding you saw, those, they don't automatically carry forward. It's not. Oh, we got this. Now we'll grow that. No, no, no. You st essentially. So when you're building justifications for what you want in the future, you got to say, okay, what do we have now? Okay. And then what, do we want things beyond that? Okay. And those things can be a number of things, which I'm going to give you some examples of in a, in a moment here. But I can see you have a you have a little question in your on your face. Well, I do. I'm still back to how much money they're earning in comfort and yeah. why we feel we have so little negotiating power. Um so I'm puzzled by that. Well, I don't know. I know that, that, well, I think that the reason why a lot of towns think they have no negotiating power is because they don't know how much money is Com Com Comcast is going to make and what's at stake for the company. It's like, it's a business relationship, people, okay? And we got to look at it as a very valuable business relationship. A lot of it is about education. People don't know this stuff. 
Yeah. It's my, you know, like I said, I've been doing this for a long time. But part of my job, I see my job when I'm retained by a local government is to help educate folks. Yeah. They can, you can make whatever decision you end up wanting to make, mm -hmm. but let's make it with some knowledge. Yeah. Let's make it with some understanding so we know what we're doing. Not, ah, that's just cable, never mind. We don't want to spend any time on it. Mm -hmm. so, so that's part of what, you know, I, I, many times I, I, I go and speak to select boards and do a presentation similar to this so that they understand what you're, it's, what, what's going on in your head right now, I think. That's great because um, do, you, do you ever get in a situation where Comcast threatens to walk? Because are, <laughs> are they going to walk away from that much money? No, I no, doubt no, it. <laughs> no, not, is it is a, oh, they'll threat, they, they, actually, I have to say in Massachusetts, I haven't heard a company trying to walk in a long time. Yeah. I've, I've heard it you know, years back, but you know, them trying to walk is like, once you understand what's at stake, you, it's, it's almost humorous to think that they would try to walk away. They'll try to bully. They'll give incorrect information to elected officials. Okay. okay. They'll, they'll, and so that's why the smarter you guys are as a committee and the smarter the select board is and the smarter the people in this community is, are, excuse me, about this process and what's at stake, the less likely if the company decides to try to put out misinformation, and I'm not saying they would, but if they did, you would have a better uh, uh, screen through which to uh, analyze that information. So, Great. okay, next slide. Um, all right, so um, here, th these opportunities are actually kind of obvious. Again, this is on, on the PowerPoint, the, the handout you have. Um, we can work toward guaranteeing that whatever technology they choose to use in the future is state of the art, okay? Which means state of the art services become avail and are available. Uh, we can make sure that there's quality customer service. And by that, I mean, they answer the telephone when you call, you don't go into voicemail hell, never to crawl out again. Um, they send a technician out when they, the technician's supposed to get there. Um, this is one that's the customer service one gets really interesting because there is, and very rarely do people look at this, but there is actually an interaction between federal customer service standards, which are sorely out of date, okay, stuff that you might put in your franchise agreement, and state consumer protection laws. Yes, there are. The okay. Department of Telecommunications Cable has a certain right. level of quality of service under their regulations. And in the previous or current process, mm -hmm. current franchise agreement, there's a, a reference to that. If you go to the actual regulations, yeah. there's a whole list of stuff. And I don't know how well we've been monitoring that uh, for compliance. And that was that's the compliance issue I'm really interested in exploring. Well, and that's what I would what will want to be exploring, particularly with the online survey. Yeah. Because the kind of questions that we'll have in a part of the online survey that does, deals with customer service, we'll pull right from what the state obligations are. Okay, and we'll see once what we get. So that, that, that shows you the interconnection between the future, what the correct requirements are, and how we get feedback through the online survey. Yeah, okay. so I'm gonna drop, there's more to this contract than just how much money we're gonna get. It's the customer service. Yeah, right. When your Comcast phone line slash internet drops, who do you call to get it fixed? Mm -hmm. That's another part of this whole process I want us to also focus on. Mm -hmm. We don't get a whole lot of Comcast complaints no, here, right. but they're going someplace and maybe they were resolved. If they're being resolved ad adequately, yeah. fine. If they're not, that's another issue. So customer services. Right. Well, I, I just want to remark that as a former Comcast customer, they did pick up the phone with a real person and they did show up when you said they were mm -hmm. going to do that was good. They also, when you complain, the price was going up every month. They would, if you complained, they would put you on a new like predatory Land. pricing, whatever, whatever. But they were very responsive, and we haven't gotten complaints. Whereas the other times I've worked in, there were people complaining. Oh, they said they were going to show up. They didn't show up. They're not answering their phone and all that kind of stuff. But we don't get that. Well, and so it'll be interesting to get asked those kinds of questions yeah. in the online survey and see what's what we get yeah. back. Since you brought up rates, there are some things that local governments are permitted to, to do in license renewal and some things they're not. There is no rate 
regulation. Mm -hmm. yeah. So just so everybody's clear, yep. okay, yep. there's no rate regulation. Well, the state is supposed to be doing No, no. Right? They've no. been deregulated. It's all deregulated. Just, just this last year. Every month, it was going up $3, $5 every single yeah. month. That's still and then if you complain, they put you back to, you know, this low amount for 12 months, and then it will start going up again. Then you complain again, and they, it's it's bizarre. So yeah, it's but there is a, a, a rates nationwide for cable are totally deregulated. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just and so you know we're you know we're going to hear people who come to participate in our process are going to complain about rates, but just understand we don't have uh, no control. But we can still collect that information, right. and well, I, I want to hear that. The fact that we're getting complaint, 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 it's like, yeah. okay, what about that? Yes, anything else? So it's exactly. a way of getting the discussion. Get, right. Um, uh, other opportunities for the future is uh, assuring support for peg access and community media, uh, making sure that Comcast pays adequate rent for a commercial use public property. And again, I'm going to I pull in that last bullet, which is looking at this process like a communications planning process for the community. Well, the next slide. Now, what are things that we're seeing as opportunities for the future? Things that we're seeing in franchise renewals around the country that have come out of a process that had needs assessment, and online surveys, and so forth. Um, number one, uh, making sure that there's the ability to distribute the community programming on, on, on multiple distribution. In other words, online, YouTube, your own channel, on the cable channels as well. Another one is to make sure that the access programming appears on the cable system in HD or whatever the highest quality uh, format is for all of the other channels at, the, at a point in time. So in other words, it's, uh, it's HD or, and we usually put in the license agreement HD or the most advanced format uh, for, you could compare it to PBS or as far as the format. The contents all, as you guys know, is all produced in HD and out anyway. Mm -hmm. But the cable company downgrades the content mm -hmm. and puts it out on SD. Why? Because the current license agreement doesn't require them to write it in HD. So they're not going to do it unless they're required to do it. I mean, and from a business perspective, one way of looking at business is I could understand that. But another way, if I look at my business as if I'm a cable operator, if my town meetings and the thing and, and different activities and events and parades around the town are going out online in HD and look beautiful, but they look crappy on the cable system. I want them to look as good as they're on online. I, I, they are online, but that's the, not the way the industry traditionally looks at the community channels. You see, I'm going to stop you there for just a minute. Right now, our channels are channels eight, nine, and ninety-nine, mm -hmm. and there's there's standard definition SD. Right. If we go to high definition. That'll boot them up to the 400 level, and won't we lose the low, low channel numbers? Um, you you could actually require them to continue to provide them in SD and have them in HD as well. Ah. But it's important to understand. Look at I think that if I'll tell you what I find in other places on this question, that a very very small percentage of people actually subscribe to the SD tier only. Yeah. So is it maybe eight percent? I mean, but it's it, easy it, for us to say go to channel eight to watch the public. Well, it, it, you know, channel the channels or... really ought not to be branded by channel number anyway when you get right down to it. I think we can discuss. Much yeah. <laughs> um, but but that's a that's a separate discussion. But you yeah you, you you're going to see and I'm going to give you an example. One of the places that we've worked we worked at is eight ten, eight years ago and they're in renewal now, and it's a suburb. It's a suburban community outlying Portland. They had eight HD access channels for almost 10 years. Okay, just give you an example of the fact that in Portland, well, Maine, Oregon. Portland, Oregon. Okay, I'm leaving. See you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and one of the things that's happened here in Massachusetts is that it's been more difficult to get the access channels in HD than in many other places around the country. And I will not, I will leave reasons why to not for this meeting. Okay. Okay. Um, but uh, just to give you a sense that asking for access in HD is not like asking for the Taj Mahal or the Eiffel Tower or some outrageous thing. It is something that's common in many other places around the country. Okay. Thanks. 
That's good to know. Well, yes, I is. have seen in Lexington, uh, when I recently renegotiated with uh, Comcast, I think it was 2019, they, they did get an HD channel from Comcast. They have three providers, including Verizon, and uh, used to be called RCN. I yeah. think they just changed their name. Yeah. But, uh, and with RCN, they were in the process of negotiation. In the case of Comcast, they got an extra channel. Mm -hmm. So it, it didn't, you know, replace one of their SD channels with HD. They actually got an extra channel. And and so part of the negotiating process it will, will be uh, determining how long, if and how long you want to preserve the SD, if you, and it, it, depending upon the percentage of people who are subscribing, or if the company basically eliminates an SD tier, the SD tiers completely, which is what I've been told they're going to be doing anyway, because they want that, they don't want duplicate bandwidth. Let me ask a question to Mark. Do you, are you able to get statistics on the viewership on channels 8, 9, or 99? No way to do that. But you can do it on the YouTube channel to see what we have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Go ahead. We can contest for that. Well, I don't, I'm sure they could. Mm -hmm. I don't We've know asked they for years and they, oh, really? yeah, yeah. They, don't, they don't do it. Right. Well, they don't, Nielsen does. But. Well, why can't that be in our agreement to get more data? It can certainly be something that you, we look yeah. at as an at, we, as an ask, and 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 there'll be as we go through this process, there'll be a lot of things we kind of ultimately decide what are our asks and what are our priorities. Yeah. Okay, um, in, making sure another thing we're seeing in a lot in many 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 places is including the name and the description of the show mm -hmm. for access in the EPG. We talk about that. Okay, uh, the ability to transmit programming live from multiple locations. Um, and basically, um, just the ability to make sure that the resources that you have available to you give you the ability to initiate new services and new ways of delivering services. So the next slide thing I want to show you, and let's go to the next one because that's okay. I don't don't click yet. Okay. <laughs> well, when you say the name of the you know, program, are you referring to the TV guide? I'm yeah I'm no I'm I'm referring to yeah the electronic programming guide that, where it says uh you know local pro, it doesn't say just local programming it says a uh, selectman board meeting yeah. on such and such a date uh, blah 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 okay just like the kind of info you have on other shows mm -hmm. but have the local shows have that kind of info too okay um, now one of the things that's happening around the country and this and and, and is um. That we're, we're at, just as we see when we look at the cable wire, we don't think of it just as cable TV anymore. There's a whole bunch of services that are delivered by the cable company on the same wire. Okay. Community media access TV stations are not calling themselves that anymore. They're calling themselves community media centers. Why? Because the technology they're de dealing with is not just about TV. So the services that they provide are also evolving. Um, now, what I'm going to show you is from that same place in Oregon that I mentioned that has the eight, has had the eight, eight, eight HD channels for a while. It's the town of Gresham, Oregon. It's a, a community outside of Portland. Um, they are, this goes to something that Vince and I were talking about, they are part of a eight city consortium that um, have been working together on access and other things for some year, for, for a long time. Okay, it goes back to the 80s. Okay, but what the, they have done in the group Metro East is the nonprofit that runs access for Gresham and all these other t cities. The long and short of this three minute video is the town of Gresham was going through a pre development process for a particular area of the town. And they wanted, because of the nature of that redevelopment process, they wanted to provide services that were neighborhood services there. Um, and they wanted to have them meet the needs of that particular neighborhood, which were seniors and new immigrants. Okay, now I know this is exactly the same kind of community as Concord, but it will, this was an issue that the town had. The town went to Metro East Metro East, then, uh, using some of its own money and some grant money, set up in a strip mall that the town, that in an old police precinct building that the town had empty, a community media center that provided that provided very special services to that neighborhood, which were how do you access to a computer, how you use a computer, um, special services, media services for youth, 
on creating videos and making music, um, and also seeing classes for seniors and how to use their smartphone. I'm going to show you a three minute clip that shows some of those services. I want you to see as you look at what's happening in other places and you know your community and then you project out what an opportunity might be, whether it's a fit or not, you can't just be looking at things through this way. So you let's give, let's give folks about it. It's about a three minute clip and then we'll go into a few other things. So we're here out at Rockwood DIY, which is Rockwood Digital Inclusion and Youth. And our goal is to bridge the digital gap so that everybody has access to the same opportunities as other people. You see them over the course of five weeks really become more comfortable with the equipment itself and not afraid to start doing things on their own. They'll start clicking off into their own websites. Changing language. Video builds. Like Google, Chrome. Creating your own space online. And upon completion of this program, they get a free computer. Working together made something really cool happen. video games to inspire young people about their future and use the games that they love to play as a catalyst for interest in activities that we believe they should be spending their time on anyway. The education system misses when they start with, we want you to do X, Y, and Z, instead of starting with, what are your interests, what are your desires, and can we do that together? And for many of those kids, well that's video games, that's a platform for success in youth development no matter what sphere we're talking about. In. In this case, we're talking about technical education. The students wrote songs and then produced the tracks uh, and recorded all the instruments and voices that they needed for their songs over the course of the first week. And then for the second week, they conceptualized and directed and filmed and edited their own music videos. I feel like everybody loves music. And for kids like us in Rockwood to have something like this, like the tools that you guys provide for us, I feel like it's really important because <coughs> we get our, you know, our story out. You know, we can tell about what we're going through in these streets and stuff. I'm here to teach uh, classes about phones and tablets uh, to anyone in the community, but we have a lot of seniors here. I think there really is a need for classes like this. I think that, uh, you know, a lot of us who didn't grow up with uh, these kinds of things, you know, we're, we're just kind of overwhelmed by them. You know, the elders that we serve and we work with, particularly the, the folks that you've connected us with, have, um, you know, are so gracious. They're so, they're so pleased to be supported without someone trying to attach an extra service or an extra fee. All parties coming in just to want to learn, just to want to get better, just to want to improve the community. I want you to look, and there's more going to come up. You can see programs, it's, it's look at all the collaborators on that project. They've got the school, they've got local businesses, they've got, I mean, but I'm not saying that's a fit for here, but I wanted to show it to you to kind of give you a sense of, as we look to the future, the, the way to think about things. By the way, this video is four years old. This is actually, they've evolved from this project to another one is they take this in a mobile media lab and they go out into the community in a vehicle and do this. But okay, so that's just sort of as we talk about 
opportunities. We've talked about technology. We've talked about consumer protection and customer service. We've talked about community programming and pay. And, and, and so we can go to the next one now. Okay. Oops. There we go. So I touched on this a little bit already, but I want to touch on it. And again, it's, not, it's in your presentation slides. Okay. The franchise renewal process, as I said, is that it starts two and a half to three years before the license expires. The cable operator says, I want to renew. The town goes, yes, we're going to proceed. And the town proceeds. It does the community needs assessment, which in our case is going to include public meetings and online survey. Um, we then, we also do something called a compliance review. So, um, I'll talk a little bit more about each of these briefly in a second. As a company complied with the current license agreement, what's in there? So we will we'll be going through a process of creating a grid that has the primary obligations and going through a process of determining whether they've complied with those second, that's the second bullet. When you get all of that together, it comes out in the form of two reports, a needs assessment report and a past performance review. That document then creates the foundation for building what should be in the new license agreement. At that point, then we proceed to do what we call an informal negotiation. Comcast will, uh, will submit a proposal that says what they want to do. We'll have what we want to do. And then the, the negotiations proceed. I'm not going to get deeper into this process, but let's go to the next slide. Okay. So in the past performance review, we'll be looking at what's in the current license agreement. Have they done it or not? We'll take public input through the needs assessment, um, online survey, et cetera. We'll report that in a, a document with key findings. Um, uh, the, the, you can go to the next one then. The needs assessment process, we mentioned the focus groups. The online survey, I want to focus on this just a minute. That deals with both past performance and the future. Mm -hmm. As I think I've kind of indicated already, we're going to be asking lots of questions about customer service, all that sort of thing. So I just want to make, pull that bullet out and say, I have it under needs assessment, but it's also really under compliance review as well. We will also do an evaluation of your current equipment facilities and, op and operation. So I'm going to be going to Mark or Jason, whoever's the most appropriate person, and I'm going to have a set of forms that you'll need to fill out. We'll need to get equipment inventory, all stuff that you've got data on anyway, I'm sure. But then we'll come in and do an actual look around, walk around. I'm going to do a little mini one today but we'll do something much more formal when we come in to do the focus groups, okay? Um, and then all of that feeds into that needs assessment report that I mentioned earlier, and you can click to the next one. Um, and so we've kind of, this is the last of the slide. This is sort of the over, oops, overview of the process, the opportunities, et cetera. What I wanna do now is I wanna, we have a few minutes left, mm -hmm. yes. And I want to go to this sheet, okay? But I want to see a question so far. I know I've thrown a lot of stuff at you, and we can go at, at upcoming meetings. We can come back at certain pieces of this, okay? And I could do uh, do Zoom, give you information. We could have more digging around into each of these pieces. Um, but the key things on, on to be aware of on this 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 two pager is this is the tasks associated with the needs assessment and compliance review. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, all of these, we would say by item number 24, I'm going to take you to the end. Yep. That means we're going to have all the reports done, everything done and ready to go by June 30th of this year. So you've got a whole almost another year to get before you to April. Oh, this 20, year? 2023. Next year. Next year. So you've got a whole almost another year after that to get to the expiration date. Gotcha. So the, the idea, and I That's didn't put, the, uh, and I'll update this with the years. So I know it was confusing. I know Carl and I talked uh, the day before I um, left to fly out here and I realized I didn't put the years. <laughs> Duh. Now, key things that I'm going to back in, we're going to back into this again. We're suggesting that uh, there's a lot of activities that build to be able to have to the point where we have focus groups. So go to number 19 and circle it. Where this calendar of activities is based upon doing the focus groups April 18th and 19th. That sounds like school vacation week or town meeting. Okay, so yeah. it's it's there. It's not a problem. 
I'm just throwing it out there because I have to build this right. calendar right. backwards. Right, okay. right. So and you probably have to do that the week before or the week after. Okay. Well, I, I have so it's also to... Ramadan, so we should steer right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's... So what I want you guys to do between now and the next meeting is give me the two days that you want to have those focus groups that are around these two and days. These are in person here. These are in person in the select board room or in the here or wherever room. we end up saying we yeah, want to have it. Uh, the town meeting is no no in person. Yeah. 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 Well, we'll be done with that stuff. Yeah, we'll be done. But this sounds like school vacation week. No, that's definitely the case. Okay. Um, yeah, the, the calendar is on online though. Okay. okay. So uh, to do for your next meeting, then, if it's okay, you know, if, if I can give you some to do's, okay, is I need to know the dates. Two dates. It'll be uh, we'll be in. Randy and I will be here in 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 Concord, doing these meetings and having any other meetings we would end up having to have. Um, but but I just need because once I have those dates, then I will build an updated version of this that that, that flows. Now, one other thing. So, so just remind me, who are we trying to invite uh, to show up for this? These focus groups. Yeah. Anybody in town who wants to come? And it's in the daytime. There'll probably be one in the day and one in the evening. That's good. Okay. Good questions. I'm glad you're asking these are exactly the kind of questions you should be asking. I'm hoping, I'm hoping Council on Aging comes. I'm hoping the Concord Housing Authority comes. Right, Those are the two groups I'm in. What about on a weekend? Does that make sense or not? We found the weekend meetings, people don't show for them. Okay. In fact, I'll, I'll be really, I mean, it'll be interesting to see. We found in recent years that the daytime meetings get more attendance than the evening ones. Mm -hmm. Because the kind of folks who tend to come to these meetings are people who are engaged yeah. as in the field, whatever field of community engagement that is, whether it's seniors or youth or or, or um, uh, special needs or neighborhood or whatever. But I do recommend one in the daytime and one in the evening. Especially if they're, by, if they're hybrid and people might be in their office, but they can turn on Zoom for an hour to be in this meeting. Or... It's very difficult to do these meetings hybrid. I will be very direct with you. Okay, because they're extremely interactive. Okay. Uh, I'm in front of the room, I give some basic information, and then I have five or six questions I'm asking people. And people are throwing ideas and we're documenting as they come. It's very difficult to do these hybrid. Yeah. And I have over the last, over COVID, I've had to do them hybrid. And that is why I'm telling you, they're very difficult to do and do well hybrid. We can do them hybrid, but I, 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 I would much prefer people coming and having a cup of coffee and getting together in a room and, and having a discussion because the people are just more engaged. They pay more attention to what's going on. Yes, we'll have a lower participation rate. <laughs> about half. No, that's that's what I've seen in this town. If you do a, yeah, if you do if you do a hybrid, you'll have about double the participation if you do it than if you do it in person. Really? Yeah. See, that's exactly the opposite of what we've seen. Yeah. And to give you an example that's and because before I always thought it was since COVID, it seems like hybrids are more. Okay, well we can do them hybrid, okay, but but the the, the richness of what I get, it's it's just not as rich. I'm I, it, and I'm just telling you what I've experienced in the okay. last two years. Okay, so let's take a quick poll around the room here for, the, for this kind of a focus group, in person or hybrid. What do you prefer? What do you think was more rational, Cynthia? Well, I know our citizenry is very adept at hybrid. I mean, that's my personal opinion. Um, and I'm not doubting you. Yeah, no, I'm just, I'm just saying what I've um, experienced. That's all. I just know that in our public meetings, I can see the level of, especially at night. Yeah. yeah. Most of our public, big public meetings occur at night. And I, some, some people just don't like to go out at night. Vince, yeah. what about you? What do you think? In person or hybrid? I, I, you know, I think in person is preferable, but you know there are issues with night and weather. Yeah. And uh, so I think you know it's it's probably useful to set it as hybrid if there's any way to encourage people to come. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. that's the rest. Of yeah. The yeah. That's it. You've yeah. got it right there. Yeah. So our materials should, you know, yeah. I think generally we like we don't care. You know, you can go yeah. on Zoom or you can. Share what I, you I recommend make. one each. So yeah. as I say, the daytime. Oh, interesting. You know, interesting. We want you to come live and come on this date, but if you really can't do it and you want hybrids, um, yeah, you, you, you do this. You got to come live the other time. 
Interesting. Well, that's, a, that's an interesting suggestion. Okay. Christina, what do you think? Oh. I think I agree with her that in the past, focus groups are always best in person, but mm -hmm. since since COVID, your attendance is going to drop dramatically with that hybrid is so yeah. the norm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mark? So I was just going to say that I think Sue's request is an interactive meeting that if it is hybrid, then someone has to be a dedicated um, web person that's interacting well, with that, that group that's saying, all right, now let's talk about this now. You know, text all of your questions in. Go, go, go. Yeah, and then, and then you know, so, yeah, we can do that. So, we can do that. So, yeah, I'm just saying, there's a lead person to person, yeah. but then there's a, there's yeah, exactly. a, you know, a Zoom person. We just did that with the housing production plan. Yeah. Um, we've been doing the whole series of focus groups with that. And they have online surveys, and everyone yeah. fills them out right then. Yeah. Okay. So okay. I'm inclined to say one in person, in one room. hybrid. Well, one in person and one in person and hybrid. Yes. That's yes. Okay. Right. Andy, I check. Okay. Are you polling your uh, currently hybrid participants on this question? Uh, David, is this you? It is, this is David I. Allen? Yes. Hi, David. Nice to meet you. Uh, uh, and thanks so much for such a detailed and lively presentation on what's otherwise an off-putting process. Apparently, my video isn't showing there. So I'm very appreciative for the suggestion that the in-person creates uh, rich responses. But I'll tell you, there's some of us who will not do it. Uh, in our 80s, and COVID's going to get worse this winter, the warning signs are all out there. We ain't coming into group meetings. Hmm? Okay. okay, good. Thanks. Sir. Thank you. Very much appreciated. Okay, we're stopping the sharing on this. All right. Um, okay, what else do you want to? Okay, so the. So we've got one of each. And so we'll, we'll give you some dates. And we'll one of each is one with encouragement. Uh, with encouragement, exactly. Thank you, Christina. Um, the other things that are on this worksheet, okay are things that we do need to talk about, but we're at the end of our meeting time for today, okay? Um, and But I wanted to give this to you because in order for the, any of this to be successful as far as getting people to participate, it will require your engagement and the engagement of other organizations and groups in promoting this. Um, in, 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 in some places we incentivize it for, if you come to the meeting, you'll not only get some food, but she'll get win a prize. Okay. I mean, one place they're giving away um, uh, echoes. Uh, um, another place they're giving away $25 grocery store cards. Okay. The idea is to bring in people who normally wouldn't come. Okay. We, we want to go beyond the usual suspects. Okay. We want to engage people who might normally not otherwise engage in order to make sure that the data that we're gathering is representing the broadest possible base of the public we can. Okay. That makes the, the data that comes into the negotiating process stronger and more legally defensible. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what I'd like to do is the next time once I have the new dates, okay, and if I, I, I will, I will back the timeline up, but I would like to walk through these things with you at, at your next meeting, because as you can see, some of the things kick into gear right, right away, mm -hmm. okay? Um, figuring out, getting mailing lists together um, and, 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 and things that I can't do, okay? Gotcha. I can't do okay, remotely, so if, I think. So if you check your calendar, if for some reason you're not available December 1 at 3.30, which I'll is the next know. one, let yeah. me know and I'll send a right. message, we'll reschedule Brett. Okay. Um, and I can let, I can probably, um, I'll put you I, on the agenda for the yeah, I, or actually I, I can, if you want to know now, yeah, let me go and step out of the room no, and check, check, right it, now. check my, my office and then you, about you, about you know. yeah. okay. All right. I just want to make sure. <laughs> yeah. Do you have anything else for your presentation? I think we're good for the day. I think everybody's yeah. falling asleep. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, it is oh. clock, but I do want to give a chance next thing we have an honor to thank you very much. Super appreciate that. Sure. Uh, we don't have any minutes ready right now because I have to circulate around late bits. You've done them and I, I apologize for not sitting around. We'll hold that off to the next meeting. Um, we're just going to be tentatively scheduled to uh, Thursday, December 1 at 3.30 to 5 o'clock p.m. Eastern. Uh, Eastern Standard Time, because we don't know. Yes. Daylight savings. Yes. Okay. Um, liaison to public comments. Uh, liaison from, uh, from Council on Aging and Select Board. Terry, go ahead. 
So thank you, Sue. This was really eye-opening and great to plan ahead. Um, and I think what article we're going to need to figure out is when do we do this number 19 focus groups before town meeting or after town meeting? And then, uh, because I, I can see pros and cons, and I can see that we're going to be in discussion on that. Because um, it could get blotted out by some. Well, I'm going to do an after town meeting right now. Yeah, I'm thinking, you know, you could get a lot of good publicity in town meeting by yeah. having We can talk or, about it. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. We can, we can, uh, there's probably so meetings April 30th. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, Christina, did you have any liaison comments from Council on Aging? Anything you want to report? No, the only thing I'm going to mention that I don't even know if this is out of line that's on something new to this is the fraud meeting is on December the 1st. Council on Aging for the first time, we're going to do the tree lighting event with some like notices and trying to get to know like the, you know, who we are. So if you guys have anything that you would like me to, to because I'm going to be doing the event, okay. do you have some literature? You have something that I think I'm going to have like a warming tent or something. Oh, good. So if you have something, it's going to be that fall weekend, maybe have ready by that. I would be more than happy to have that be part of our little get Got it. Yeah, thank you very much. That's marvelous. That's a wonderful yeah. opportunity for us. Because it'll be next Sunday. Yeah. Um, I have another quick question, Fire which is, um, so you mentioned that you would um, come and present to the select board. Is that after this timetable? Or? It's a, it is an option. It, it is something that I can do if you want me to. I think it would be great. Um, yes. and you like it? I mean, um, you know, it depends what the chairman is going to do and who's chairman that and everything, but I'm just trying to get a sense, is it something that would happen in this timetable or after the June 30th? I would tend to suggest that it happens before the focus groups. Before the focus groups. Okay, so I think we should add that in. So that's the current chairman. I will talk to him. Yeah. Talk like, to uh, if you have an idea what month Approximately want that will help. He can get it on the calendar now. Like, you want it in March, you want it whatever month. Okay, April 30th is our town meeting start date. It'll probably be a couple of days, I'm going to guess, this year for yes. annual town meeting. Yes. So um, the focus group meeting would be after April 30th. Mm -hmm. probably, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. But I think probably the, maybe the second week of May, perhaps. Yeah, before people leave in June. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to. Recommend at this point, second week of May yeah. for the focus group. Okay. So, so that, in that case, like, would you want the select board um, presentation to be, you know, two months before that or one month or whatever? Just let me know and I'll get to the chairman. Okay. Yeah. Second week of May is May 8th. That's a Monday through May 12th for next year. So, somewhere in there. Yeah. So, I will, I'll re rebuild this. The timeline it's just a little shifting around uh, not a problem um with some two days in that week do you find it better tuesday wednesday wednesday thursday thursday Friday? uh what days uh, do key things happen select board is monday night tuesday monday night. nights okay anything else any school other committee, school tuesday committee night. is tuesday night tuesday night all right um so i'm thinking wednesday thursday yeah sorry okay so for those two dates would be may 10 and may 11. And wednesday is may 10 of 2023 and Thursday is May 11th. Yeah, that would be, that's, that that, 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 that's where it lands, it okay. lands. Okay, then I'll just back this up and I'll get this that. to you before your next meeting okay. with the whole updated schedule. I'll, I'll then back to your question about when to do this. If the focus groups are then, we could probably- the calendar. Um, this is May. Yeah, this is May. So we're gonna, we're gonna back, we wanna do, I, I would think that earlier we get the select board up to speed on some of this stuff, mm -hmm the better because we want okay so i would say i'll probably do this by zoom because i don't have another yeah. trip in budgeted okay mm -hmm. so i would say probably in um february or march mm -hmm. 15 or 20 minutes what do you think to her um questions yeah my, yeah i don't know okay so, so i would recommend so, you prepare a, a button so that, but um let me see if i can get it on the calendar i'd recommend you prepare a five to ten minute talk and then I'll, there, I'll be honest with you this I, 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 how am i going to cover that you, you're going to have to uh, uh, they're not going to tolerate that it's too long 
You okay. have to abbreviate part of it. The key parts that the select board has to deal with. Yeah. Well, so we usually do. Yeah, thank you. We don't go through all the slides. Yeah, yeah. No, I understand that part. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, and I, then, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I hear you. I mean, some of the stuff that you just said, and we can talk about it offline, but yeah. some of the stuff you said in the beginning today, like what is the purpose of the franchise agreement? And you have, you know, what are the goals of it? And you have, I wrote down five or six goals uh -huh. here. And, yeah. you know, the part about the $63 million and, and okay, we, you know, we have strong negotiating power mm -hmm. and the select board needs to be aware of that. That, you know, just highlight a few things like that and save most of the time for, for questions. questions. Okay, and got it. Get engaged, yep. If they get engaged, it's a very smart and independent board right now. We just, um, so no to a developer and it was um, did? Yes, they yes, did. We did. Yes, they did. <laughs> it, it, it's a good question. That it'll be an active, it'll be a hot bench for questions. Okay. Yeah, and it'll then, be fun. If they get engaged, yeah. then it, it's their choice as to how long they will want questions. It's also the town manager you're going to be talking to because she's the one who's controlling access to the town council. Okay. Which right. you'll need for negotiation. Right. right. But if the select board gets engaged, then you'll back up tough negotiation. Okay. Yes. Based yes. On, right. mean, this is a very strong group right now. Okay. So it's really interesting. So I'll hit the high points of everything, expecting that there's going to be a bunch of questions. Yes. Is that you're just yes. you're telling yes. me about yes. this? Yes. Okay. Got it. Got it. Yeah. And okay. that'll be okay. February or March, you think? Well, let me um uh, talk to Matt mm -hmm. and um I'll okay. get back. Yes. Yeah. Them. Just let me know. I mean, that's going to be the hardest part. Then on the agenda. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you just yeah, and we can and that's that's terrific. I mean, this is something that I'm glad you think it's a good idea. I found in my experience, it works very positively toward what's well, going. We'll have this video to watch ahead. ahead of exactly. Time. There exactly. That that's yeah. That is true. Also. If they want. Yeah. If they want. Okay. okay. What else do we need? Okay, public okay. comment. David, do you and Nancy have anything to say? Because we're just about to the end here. David, you're on mute no. still. No, but Nancy? thank you for asking. Okay, thanks, Very Nancy. Complete. Thank uh, you. Sorry, sorry. That's okay. Um, very quickly, um, we learned earlier that uh, something going on in quote Massachusetts, so that uh, quote it's harder to get. Uh, HD on public channels. Uh, we'd like to learn what it is about Massachusetts, particularly Comcast in Massachusetts, that's leading to this outcome, either here or offline. But uh, clearly, there's some knowledge on this subject, and I'd like to find out what that is. Yeah, we could we could we could provide it. Um, I, I can tell you this much very briefly, and then there's more behind it. There's a lot of access channels and a lot of towns that have access channels in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. I mean, all, many, 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 many compared to most states. Mm -hmm. And because of that, um, the company doesn't like to give, if they give one here, then they don't want to give two over there because then the one who knows they got two, maybe somebody else went too. It's, it's that kind, that's part of the reason. Okay. They uh, figure if they keep control of the number of channels they're giving out and if they, they won't have to give out more than they then let's say the three that's currently in place okay um there are other reasons as well the company will say well we don't we don't want to waste the bandwidth on that local stuff i mean I, i'm telling you words that have been used for me to me over the last 30 years i'm not saying comcast said that someplace I've worked here. I'm just saying that's the sort of reasoning I've received, okay? Mm -hmm. And we've heard in many communities. So there are other things than that, but those are two primary things. They, there's so many there's so many access operations or so many channels in Massachusetts, we just can't get more than one. And it sounds like, yeah. sounds like to me, we need a union of cities and towns all coming at one time and saying, hey, now's the time. Guess what? It's not a waste for us. Thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Thanks, David. Appreciate that. Okay. Any other comments, nope. observations, folks from the bench here? No, thanks. Okay. Um, I think that's it for today. I'm going to adjourn <laughs> this meeting. Thank you very much and enjoy your day. Thanks all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.